Good morning, marketers, and welcome to the If You Market podcast. We are the only podcast that markets the shit out of it. I'm your host, Sky Cassidy, joined by co-host Carla Jo Helms. Hi, guys. And uh, today we'll be talking with Laura Patterson of Vision Edge Marketing about her new book, Fast Track uh, Your Business. It has a longer title as well. I'll let you uh, throw that out there in a, in a minute, Laura. Um, but uh, we've had Laura on the podcast several times. I believe you are our top guest. I'm so excited to have you back on. It's been about a year since we last spoke to you. I'm really thrilled to be talking to you again, Laura. Thank you, Sky and Carla. I'm really glad to be back with you guys, too. It's always fun when we have a conversation together. So sometimes we'll do a, um, sometimes we will do a demo of a product. Sometimes somebody has a book and we're talking about it, but we're not really like a talk show circuit where people have a book and they come on and you know, every day it's either a movie or a book that somebody, but today I feel like this is our, uh, our B2B book club or something, because we're going to yeah. be focusing just very heavily on your new book, Fast Track Your Business. Can you give the, uh, the whole title for me? There's no way I could remember or say that. It's Fast Track Your Business, a Customer-Centric Approach to Accelerate Market Growth. Fantastic. And we'll have a link to that in the, uh, in the, in the show notes for the listeners, of course. You are a serial book writer. Let's just put that out there for people. You. <laughs> <laughs> it is my fourth one, uh, unintended fourth one. Um, but yes, it's the fourth one and um, it's, it's being really well received. I, I feel so grateful to the people who are reading it and who reviewed it. Okay, so first question, when you write a book, how scary is it to put it out there? And yeah. Do it's you stop looking at social media for a while in fear of the response or lack of response or lack of response maybe if nobody like no, nobody comes to your party <laughs> yeah it is scary that is a great question and you're right you know you, you've you've poured yourself right poured your thinking poured your soul poured your time poured your energy into this endeavor uh you're trying to share something that means something to you to uh, with others and you hope it resonates you hope it's relevant uh, and so if it doesn't resonate and it doesn't it isn't relevant of course that's disappointing um, so yes, it's, it, it is kind of scary. I was really fortunate uh, uh, in, in a couple of ways, um, maybe three or four ways. Uh, first, I uh, had a concept, um, a framework that we call the circle of traction that had been something that's been a critical part of our company for ever since we started in 1999. And we had um, shared this with folks over the years. And in particular, one CMO, a number of times and so john encouraged me to take the story and the work that we shared in his growth summit to into a book so i had a customer who was familiar with it who had used it encourage me so that that made it a little less scary because i would have figured he would content you kind of worked it back i kind of had the content that you'd been using and you had all this feedback and market research and data and you worked it back into a book that, that's exactly right. Um, that, that, Carla, that's exactly right. So the second thing that was um, made it less scary is that I had the opportunity to host a radio program for Jim Obermeyer for uh, not last year, but the year before. And the name of the show was Ready, Set, Grow. And it uh, provided me an opportunity to uh, put Austin CEOs, successful Austin CEOs, uh, in the limelight and for them to share uh, how they were growing organically and sort of what, what, how they did it and the role marketing played. And they too were very supportive about this idea. And in fact, are mentioned, almost all of them are, I think all of them are mentioned in the book. Their stories are woven into the book. And so that was another sort of indicator, positive indicator, right? That made it um, a little less scary. And so that was helpful. And then when I came up with the book, uh, and those of people out there who have written a book know that you start sort of with a concept, you flesh it out, you create an outline, you know, all the things that you would normally do. And um, I shared that with people I trust, trusted advisors, and got back some really positive feedback. And so that was another sort of encouraging signal. So I would say that even though it was scary and I wondered, um, the fact that I had those sort of signals out there 
were helpful. You know, they didn't guarantee success, of course, and it certainly doesn't guarantee that anybody will buy the book, but at least I know that I was writing something that was uh, relevant um, and, and resonated with people. And that was really what was important. And was used, obviously. I mean, the, like in your line of work and ours too, I mean, it's the application, right? And the, and the results that's so important rather than something that's just left on the shelf. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it wasn't a complete Hail Mary for you. you. You took it out like a comedian going out to some clubs and workshopped it a bit uh, ahead of time. A few stand-up routines and then... <laughs> yeah, that's a great way. Definitely a few stand-up routines. Yeah. Definitely. And a few of those probably early on bombed. So I'm really glad that what we, what we came out, we had an amazing uh, book producer um, that helped. And the people, you know, like any show... It takes a ca uh, an entire cast, some that are behind the scenes and some that are in the front of the uh, camera. And we had so many wonderful people behind the scenes. I cannot thank all of them enough. Um, and that made a huge difference too. A great editor, a great pro book producer, all of that makes a huge difference. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in the, uh, in the book club um, theme here, I guess before having you give a, the the overview and just really tear through the content so nobody even needs to go out and buy the book. Um, <laughs> can you give a, can you give a bit of a teaser on what's new in this book when it comes to fast tracking your business to rapid growth? I mean, there's a ton of books about like, it's almost like the business version of, of get rich quick, the uh, grow quick, um, uh, you know, make profits quick. Uh, what's, What's new in the in in this book? Are, do you, are there some new ideas, some new techniques? Well, first of all, it has it provides a very clear framework. It's called the circle of traction. It step by step how to move through that circle to grow your business. It's very got really good examples in it and very specific how tos. So Is it, you know, when you say to grow your business, what do you it, it, grow it in marketing? Grow it organically? Like what do you mean there? If somebody said, well. What, you know, there's so many bit, like books on growing my business. What is this geared around? Like, how can we tell our listeners? Yes, that's a great question, Carla. And it really is about, it's for business leaders, primarily in the B2B space. So, uh, you know, if you're a baker, I'm not sure this is exactly that, although it's certainly applicable because this is about being very customer centric. So if you're a baker, you probably want to really understand the customers that you're going to be baking for, right? and how you're gonna position your baking compared to the competition. So right. it's very, very applicable in that sense to any company. And it is about organic growth. This isn't about how to do diligence for our merger or an acquisition. This isn't you know, how to grow your business so you can sell it. This is really how to take a customer-centric approach to growing your business in a very methodical way, starting with what I believe is the most important thing, and that is your customers. What is it? they want, they need, what are the insights you have, and what is the aha that you are bringing to the table, and how do you articulate that aha in a way that will help you develop a strategy um, and a and segmentation and positioning. Ooh, I want the book. All, yeah, the all book. of that that ultimately <laughs> leads to execution, and I think that's um, a lot of books get very focused on execution. The down, so one of the things we talk about in this book is uh, we build off of the concept of the difference between upstream and downstream marketing and how important they are that they work together. And a lot of books right now are very downstream or oriented, like how do you get better SEO, how to make a better website, how to make a better lead magnet, how to make a better landing page, and on and on and on. That's all downstream, and you've got to do those things, and you've got to do them well. Compared to, give us some examples of upstream. So how you segment your market, how you really define your personas, um, how do, what is the real customer buying journey and their journey, not what you, what you call it, right? So we have conversations all the time around like qualified leads, right? People say, I want more qualified leads. I'm like, but nobody, no customer wants to be thought of as a qualified lead. So what yeah. is it? <laughs> so, what, right? So the real question is, what is it you, what behavior are you looking for from your customer that signals the buying intent? And what, and how and did you create different buying intents for different services, right? Or different levels, right? You have to know Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And the more complex that uh, the product is and the more people involved in the, in the decision-making, obviously, there will be different indicators along the way of where that 
where that uh, organization is in the process. So this I'm picturing is uh, actually referring to somebody accidentally as a qualified uh, lead uh, <laughs> in a form fill or something like that. Uh, good morning, Mr. or Mrs. Qualified Lead, and, and the horror <laughs> that the prospect or client would have. Yeah, th there you go. That, you know, Sky, you do those LinkedIn posts sometimes, yeah. <laughs> and you talk about, you know, things that people do right and things that people do wrong. I love those. I love those posts that you do on LinkedIn. The last one was us blowing it and uh, not properly form filling the name in an email. Um, we, we migrated uh, email delivery platforms and uh, forgot to change the form fill code. So obviously from one platform to the other, the code's not usually the same. Love those snafus. Yeah, when they moved the creative over, they just moved the creative over and didn't update. You could just blame it on COVID. It you know, good. COVID can yeah. be like the blame <laughs> for many things. Like El Nino was, what was that, 10, 15 years ago? <laughs> yeah, I yeah. thought it was a good opportunity for us to say, hey, you know, I make fun of these, but we do them and I do them too. And most of the mistakes yeah, people make. Up, they, right? Like if, if you're making fun of somebody else from the mistake and you've never made it, Eh, either it's a really bad mistake that people just shouldn't make or more likely we've all made all the mistakes. Maybe you should put a disclaimer on all your posts that says, yeah. you know, <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm making fun, I've actually done this. <laughs> right. <laughs> Be a little yes. more self-deprecating. And, and, the, the, and, and learning from those, right? The key is to learn from that. And so, you hope. Um, you hope. Knowing, knowing, I know you know this guy, but you know, my, I have a propensity to lean to the science side of marketing so it's more about data and process and insights and analytic and measurement and so this book is really filled with that perspective um clearly we that doesn't uh replace being creative because creatives should be bringing those insights to life right really good creative but i have again a, a wanting you know companies that move very very quickly and they're like just make something make a website just just send out emails, right? Without really having that anchored into insights uh, from the market and from the competition and from really the customer. Getting into the quality and the viability of the marketing cycle. You know, I think people go get up a website, get out some emails. You know, they're they're in the the quantity portion, but you do have to evolve. It sounds like what you're doing is really making it viable for a long term uh, survival. You know. Yes, and. Exactly. And Carla, so the book is, um, takes you through what we call the circle of traction. And what the cool thing is about a circle is that it's never ending. So, right. you, I get so, that. so you start with the circle bigger at the top. And bigger and bigger. Yes. yes. And faster and faster eventually also. So yeah, you is, do. You gain that momentum, right? Yeah. So when we talk about accelerating market growth, it's really about how do you use this wheel, get it to turn, and then how do you get enough traction so that you get increased momentum as a result and that's really uh, the essence of, of the book. I've heard to it referred to as the flywheel before um, this uh, kind of having this idea of you're not done with a customer is? once you sell them um, because of the fact that it, it, the flywheel is based on picking up momentum and you're, you're adding energy to it to, and building on what's already there um, never really letting go of the customer just because you sold them and now they're dead and gone kind of a thing. So we've, we've gone around a little bit on it. Can you give us a couple, you mentioned how to's. I know that the listeners are probably thinking, okay, that's what they really want. Um, it's something they can, they can bite down on and remember. Can you give us a couple or, or uh, one or two how to's here? Um, yes, for, for absolutely. So we actually even give them very specific questions to ask. So we, uh, for example, I'll, when we're talking about um, the upstream and the downstream, and we ask, say, before you do anything, make sure you've got the upstream right. We actually take them through 10 questions that you should answer before you move on. So the book is really designed to like, take a moment, be thoughtful, take your time, use the book as sort of a working book as opposed yeah. to just a reading book. And so we have, you know, 10 questions, answer these 10 questions before you keep on going. Um, that's like right at the very beginning, like on page 23. Can you give us a couple of the questions, then they'll have to go. You bet. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, here's a couple of them. Sure. Um, one question is, what will our customers want next? Mm -hmm. uh, another one is, uh, what, uh, what, what customers do we want next? Right? As an example. And I think that's a really important thing to 
make sure they are in sync with one another because what customers want next and the kinds of customers you want next, they better be lined up or you're going to find yourself, you know, really out of sync. When you say what they want, what do the customers want next? Do you mean within their experience with you or within their whatever product you're selling them kind of, uh, so is it when we've done this for them, what do they want next in our kind of customer journey? Or are you talking about what do they want next in the life of their business kind of, uh, you know, within whatever the scope is of the product you're selling them? Um, the answer to that is yes. So we want to know <laughs> what they want next for their business, right? Because we're supposed to be solving problems for customers, right? And determining whether what they want next for their business is in line with what we want to bring to the party. What they want next from our products, our services, in our category, right? Mm -hmm. So as you begin to narrow that down and move through that process, and it's what they want next in products and functionality and benefits and all of that in line with what the kinds of products and services we want to create and offer. Right. And can so we- as, as an example, uh, a self-serving example here, my company, Mountaintop Data, we provide data for business to business marketing. And we might look at it and say, okay, somebody's gonna buy a list from us. What do they want next? So they probably need uh, email delivery. So how are, how are they going to be getting that? Do we need to help out in that area as well? Um, but then there's also the bigger what they want next of what do they want next from their data? A year from now, what are they going to need with their data? Here's now we're providing them emails and titles and stuff like that. But um, you know, what's the, uh, I think a while back intent data didn't quite exist yet. And that was kind of the next in data. Um, there's always something more people are going to be looking for product wise down the road. Um, and then there's the next thing they're going to be doing with your product or service that they may also need. We started providing email delivery services because we found a lot of our clients, they wanted to buy a list and run campaigns, but they didn't have a way to run the campaigns. So without finding somebody who could send the emails for them, they weren't going to, to buy to buy our product. Um, exactly. so it, it's really example. both of those things. And and then you deciding what kinds of customers you want next for the kinds of products that you're bringing to market. So as you thought about intent data or you thought about email delivery, what kinds of customers did you want next? Because they're, right? So maybe you were looking for customers that don't want more than just a list in terms of capabilities, as opposed mm -hmm. to, it might be hard to get people who are just wanting, I'll make this up, lists who have various other ways to bring it to market you, yeah, you can make money on that, but that doesn't really allow you to grow the life cycle and um, lifetime value of the customer, right? Right. So, so for you as a company, your initial client might not be your end. Like maybe today you want to market to these people and sell to these people, but a year from now, you're thinking, hey, here's, here's the audience we really want to be selling yep. to down, down exactly. the road. Uh, exactly. Sort of so now, I have a question. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. So, you know, that question is like, uh, you know, what, what do they need next or what, you know, a lot of that is uh, you can get you to think you go back and it's almost like your own market research because you can go like, okay, well, the, 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 the main thing that they ask for the common denominator after they get this, like Sky was saying is they need this and they need this, right? Do you have something in there as far as like, um, questions to ask, like as far as say market research, you go to mo your most loyal clients and you find out what do they need and want? What do they need next? Things like that to help you formulate it if you don't know. Yes, you're such a great straight person. KJ, you're such a great straight person. So when you, get into, person? When you get into page- What's a straight person? I'm not straight. <laughs> no, I just <laughs> think. Um, so one of the things we talk about is how do you get insights into the customers, the market and the competition. And we do talk a lot about how to have, do customer research and the difference between research and social listening, right? And that research is really about having a specific hypothesis that you're going to go get an answer to, as opposed to um, just listening and seeing what's coming in and why you need both. And the role of customer advisory boards um, and how you can leverage existing customers and, mm. and all different kinds of ways. So we definitely go into that. And one of the things, back to being a working book, well, we have a, a little, uh, it's called 23 questions. It's a 23 question yes or no kind of thing that allows you to ask yourself when you complete this sort of questionnaire that we have in there, it will tell you what kind of data you actually need to go and get. 
Mm. You, <laughs> right? So, because you can't boil the ocean, you can't get the answer to every single thing. So you want to know what you need, really need for that particular thing, right? Yes. And so boil yeah, it down, it helps you boil that down. Yes. It's, in fact, this is different than the assessment we have that you, if you buy the book, if you buy the book, we have a free assessment you can get online from our website that you can actually figure out where on the wheel you are and where you need to, sh what you need to shore up. This really is an, a, a question is to help you understand what information you really need to go and get. So it's a little bit of a different kind of thing. So you're not talking data like the data my company, provides. you're not telling them here's the type of list you need to market to. You're talking uh, data like what information, are you in a stage where you need to go talk to customers? Are you in a stage where you need to you know, create your personas, that, that, that kind of thing? Yeah, so here's a quick question that's in there. Like, do we know, so here's a question. Do we know which problems and markets leverage our strengths in management, technology, operations, marketing, distribution, or financing? Yes or no? And the answer is, we don't really know. We probably ought to go find that out. Uh, can we make uh, changes to our capabilities to make it possible for us to pursue new opportunities that leverage those, right? Those are really good research questions, right? So that's an example. Uh, once you know and have this information, then you should be answering the question, what is, where are we going to place our bets to, to win, right? And a lot, of, it's amazing to me how many companies we talk with that have no idea how to formulate that, the answer to that question. Oh, I might hear we want to double revenue, or I might hear we want to grow our, we want net new logos, uh, or something like that. They might get a little better. We want some new logos, um, you know, in this region or in this market, but they're very, very vague. Well, that's like saying, I think I kind of want to head west. I mean, really? <laughs> it is a pretty amazing when you do talk to a lot of business owners how you know much that uh you know we're we're shooting by the hip right like oh what about this what about that but are you talking about after you lay it out the data you look at all your advantages and resources and you go where's my low-hanging fruit let's start there let's come up with some uh you know goals and some metrics to go with that and then work it that way no this is that that yes you do need to do that but this is really about where you're going to place your bets. And those bets may or may not be low hanging fruit. They may be, you may say, look, right. So maybe we're going to place our bets on a very specific set of partners, or maybe we're so going to place really our know we want to do that sort of account based marketing or those types of partners or whatever. And then what do we have to do to do that? Yeah. It might be channel partners, it might not even be customer partners. It might be, we need three partners that do X and we need three partners that do Y. And we yeah. want that, right? And what does that look like? So, is it a partner? You know, let's say it's a partner in IT services. What kind of IT services, and what kind of customers do they need to have, right? So, we want customers that that do IT services for small to medium-sized enterprises. You know, companies that are fifty million to five hundred million. Now you're really getting clarity about where you want to place your bet, right? Yeah. So it's, right. it's things like you might have many products, but you may find, hey, we want to focus on this one, or we don't even want to focus on getting new customers. We need a package, need three things, two of right. them which you deliver. We don't want to focus on new customers. We want to focus on um, increasing the spend from our existing customers. So it could be like yeah. where within your business you're going to get this growth. You're saying it's not just um, go out, market, get new customers in the door. It, it could be from a lot of different areas. And well, think about commercial banking, right? Mm -hmm. The very first thing that people want in commercial banking is your checking account as your business. Why? Because you're very sticky. Bank companies don't really want to change around their bank, their bank checking account, right? And, the, and so then the next question becomes, okay, I've got my bank checking account. What else might make sense? Or think about CPAs and companies, right? So you, the CPA, maybe you're using them for bookkeeping, but now you really need someone also for uh, doing your fi tax filing. Maybe you could when you were small do tax filing, but now you're getting bigger, right? And so the CPA's thinking, CPA firms are thinking, what kinds of customers do we want? What kinds of services do we have? So maybe we need a bookkeeper because that's our way in the door. Right? Yeah. Right. Right. Maybe right. you it's just need to have your managers create a bunch of fake bank accounts for users so that you can 
uh, hit your numbers and get bonuses. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Anything. So that, that's in the front end of the book. And once you get past the front end of the book, which is all about the insights um, the, and the uh, outcomes and the performance targets, now you're into strategy. And it's amazing to me how many times, again, I'll ask a company, so what's your growth strategy? And I, I get during the headlights looks, right? Really, I, they, I don't, a lot of times they don't know. And I think it's really important to be clear about what your growth strategy is. Uh, so for example, my growth strategy, not mine personally, but a company's growth strategy might be uh, farm our backyard, right? That could be a growth strategy, right? We're just, we're gonna go after businesses that look like X in our backyard. That's a mm -hmm. growth strategy that is very different than people who are saying, look, we're gonna go for regional players in this market. Totally different kind of a growth strategy. Or versus someone who says, we're gonna go build out, leverage our ecosystem and identify key players in the ecosystem that we wanna be in and use that as our way of getting into the market. Another right. example- You mentioned from, channel partners. Um, I think maybe a way for, for listeners to, uh, I'm sure all the listeners completely grasp and understand this already, but another way that's uh, an example that everybody would understand and is very different than the standard, you have a product, now you launch it and you market it out to everybody in your audience and the customers flow in is um, Facebook when they started. Their growth strategy wasn't, we're gonna raise revenues and do a nationwide launch. They started in one college and then they really locked that down and then they spread out and they spread out and they did kind of a divide and conquer and just conquer one, one area at a time. And then eventually they were already big by the time they, um, they burst and it just fit for their product better than other growth strategies. So you're saying there's a, there's a lot of different ways that, um, that you can approach getting your product out there everywhere. Yeah. Not Depends just sell, how massive so media blitz. Face, not knowing a whole lot about how Facebook did it, but Facebook was kind of like an adjacent market strategy. We'll start in this market and that will be a stepping stone to this market. And then that'll be a stepping stone to this market, right? And then that market will be a stepping stone to the next market. And so that's a very, very valuable way to, to have a, a growth strategy because most companies have a few customers. Uh, another is a kingpin strategy, right? We're gonna go after these five or six accounts because when we go after these customers, everybody in their market was watching what they do and who they do business with. And that will make it a lot easier for us to get more business because we will have these kingpins or lighthouse accounts or whatever the anchor accounts or whatever you wanna call them. Right, I'd say, um take that back to uh, Microsoft and, and uh, Bill Gates. When he first started out, he got the contract to make the operating system for um, IBM and he got paid almost nothing for it. I think they barely covered their costs and everybody thought he was crazy and he knew what he was doing. It was an anchor account. He knew if IBM was using their operating system, all the other PC manufacturers would have to use their operating system and they could charge those guys. Um, but they just needed to get the, the anchor account with, with IBM. And to do that, they had to do it almost for free. Um, yeah, that was a strategy. They, yep. In their mind, we have to win IBM. How, we got to get our toe, our foot in the door at IBM. That's a foot in the door strategy, right? Get our foot mm -hmm. in the door and then we can go from there. So there are lots of examples of strategies, but it's amazing. People might intuitively be thinking about them, but they haven't actually written them down or articulated them. So if that you can articulate them, as, so the leadership team needs to be able to articulate the strategy in a way that everyone understands exactly what we're trying to do, yeah. right? So after you do that, you know, we, and we labored back and forth many years ago, is it innovation first and then strategy, or is it strategy first and then innovation? And eventually we settled on strategy first and then innovation, because once you know your strategy, that's going to have implications. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm sure some people do it backwards because they, you know, d you know figured something out. Right. But if you yeah, have a big idea, idea, yeah, that then you need to strategize around it. You're saying find a need and fill it versus have an amazing idea and then figure out how to sell it kind of a. Yes. I mean, I, I know what it's like to work in a company that has that sort of product centric engineering centric you know, view, if we build it, they will come. And there is potentially that does happen. We have seen lots of cool things. Potentially. That yeah. potentially. The title of our podcast speaks against it because we say you have yeah, to market the shit out of it for them to come. But uh, yeah, I agree with you, right? <laughs> so 
what else can I tell you about the book? Is this Aunt giving you some Hold ideas? Hold on one second. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to take a quick break. Time is just flying by here. Um, we're going to have a short, uh, short second half left, but um, let's take a quick break. Thank you for listening to the Iffy Market podcast. We have our, um, let's call it our book, book club edition. We're talking with Laura Patterson about her new book. Um, and I lost the title of the book. Uh, <laughs> Fast track your business. Fast track. We'll back in just a minute. All right. I'm going to pause it for a bit. We're on three, two, one. Welcome back to Market Podcast. I'm your host, Sky Cassidy. We have Laura Patterson on today trying to cram as much information from her book, Fast Track Your Business, in as we can. Uh, Laura, we went over kind of the, some of the front end work in the first half. There are so many more questions and things to get to. Can you give us a, a quick overview of kind of the sections of the book? So even if we don't get to everything and people do have to actually go get this book still, they can have a, a, a big idea of the different, uh, different areas yes. that it's covering. We have to do it. So we, as I said, it's a circle and the circle is made up of seven nodes. And I'll tell you about this in a moment. And the circle, like all wheels, needs a hub. And inside there, this circle is a hub. Um, the, the hub is, if you don't have a hub, the circle will turn. And so like your organizational structure, your culture, your people, their skills, your processes, your systems, your data, that's part of the hub. If you don't have those things, it's going to be really hard to turn your circle. So I think that's also something that people forget is that, the, is that you have to have a good hub. Uh, they're not part of the wheel. Yeah. They are the hub. Yes, they're not the wheel. They're the hub. And yeah. um, there's seven nodes. The first one being, being customer-centric starts with customer insights that leads to being clear about where you're going to place your bets your outcomes and how you're going to know you got there which leads to this conversation we were having about strategy and innovation now that you've done those first three things you're ready to move into what we would call a much more tactical or execution phase which is around segmentation and positioning once you have that clear now you're into having a plan executing that plan what does that really look like and this might not only be marketing, right? There may be things that have to happen in your service organization or in your support organization or your product organization that have to plan and achieve those big bets. It might not mm -hmm. only be a marketing thing that's keep keeping you from growth. All the best marketing in the world will do you absolutely no good if you don't have a good product, right? So if, all, if marketing can get all these people to trial your, your SaaS product, for example, but nobody goes from trial to customer. I say you've got a problem with your product or your trial experience, right? So probably not a marketing fix. So you want to get, find that out right away and get those things fixed as part of your plan and execution. And that leads into uh, operational excellence, like how you're going to measure what you're doing, the pro uh, how you're going to put it in play, uh, how you're going to know what's working and not working is into performance optimization and management. And by getting that information about what is and isn't working and whether or not you're hitting your targets and all of those things, you get more insights, right? You get more feedback from customers and then that feeds your wheel. And so that's essentially the wheel in a nutshell. So you'd mentioned that not everybody's, it's not like there's a start point to the wheel. They're going to figure out where they're at right now and pick up from there. Um, well, there is a start point. I, mean, I, okay. I said correctly. The start point is your customer, right? Customer okay. insights. You got to start there. Customer insights. So whether you have it or you have to go get it. Hmm. Yes, it's that's your starting but, point. But yeah. they exactly. may be at a certain. They may be right now at a certain point in the wheel. Maybe they need to go back to the, to, to that start point of the customer insights. But if they they can look at and say, oh, here's where we're at right now, and then they like, can oh, see all the steps they oh, missed before them. that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's why the way that's why the 23 questions uh, is so important because that will tell you what kind of information you have or don't have, right? And that may or may not tell you that you can pass. Like, oh wow, we have what we need. What we really haven't done is done a really good job of creating a strategy, right? Or we really don't have clarity around our outcomes, and that's why we're not going anywhere because we're all over the map. Isn't so, three one of those loaded numbers? Did you consider doing 24 or 22? Uh, it was just was That's the number of people 23 is one of those right. numbers they they freak out about um <laughs> there's a couple people listening saying yeah 23 oh my god i'm freaking out um <laughs> it's a jim carrey movie or something like that uh so what size company does this 
really apply to? Is it for everybody? Is it for Absolutely. startups? Um, who should be considering looking at this and who is this not really in their wheelhouse? So I think that um, it's definitely for any B2B company, any B2B company, wherever, whatever stage it's in. I think there's some, like we talked about earlier, B2C companies that might benefit. Never hurts to know whether you're in a market that really prefers an, um, gluten-free cookies versus one that doesn't. And if you're making a bunch of cookies and they're not gluten-free and you happen to be in a part of town that really is like about gluten-free, that might be mm -hmm. a problem or a city. Yeah. That it might if you're selling problem. your extra sugar cookies in Berkeley, you might have a problem. Right. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, I don't, you know, I'm just saying it does kind of help to know if you're going to be a local bakery, what are the things that people want to buy? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and what are their uh, preferences? Uh, so and along they want with like spirulina in their cookies you never know you have to find so out it sounds silly but and some people listening are like of course you want to know what your people want but uh to other people listening maybe you think the people who are so product centric they're so in love with their idea a lot of startups that they don't realize it's not what the audience wants or they need to go to another area and find out who that audience is because they think their idea is so awesome everybody's going to want it and then they're putting it out to everybody and turns out there's either a small niche that wants it or they may be in love with it but not anybody else is well that, that's certainly true and i mean there are companies that like and everyone knows the stories of companies that have a cool a cool thing but they didn't know what to do with it mm -hmm. like the the glue that uh 3m made that didn't stick but then they permanently but then oh wow we could put this on make post-it notes and they made a whole business out of it yeah, that happens. No one's saying that doesn't happen. But when you think, just think about cars, right? Because we have a lot of, we talk about cars. Cars came around in the late 1800s, but there was a lot of things that didn't allow for a car. I mean, the first cars were here, but it took a long while for those cars to get adopted by the consumer. And that had a lot of different reasons. That took evolution. And I think, you know, that has a lot to do with the infrastructure that was in place or not, right? Um, availability price point so, so the point i'm making here is it was great to have the cool idea about a car but what did that really do in terms of adoption it took a long while because the market really wasn't ready for a car right. it seems like a no-brainer now but it could have failed and probably did fail many times before it finally succeeded um there are probably a lot of little failures along the way to to make the automobile that again seems like so much of a no-brainer now wasn't exactly a uh, well, think, think about it. Well, like, we have cars coming out today. Car. We have cars coming out today that don't make it. I remember mm -hmm. the Sterling a few of a couple of decades ago didn't make it, right? As a car, we have electric cars that to come out on the market for probably 50 years. We've had different iterations of electric cars, right? So again, that goes to show you what really understanding the market and what customers want and when they're ready to buy it. Yeah, great ideas fail more often than not. <laughs> yes, and that is true. I guess I'd say this. Uh, so your book and this, um, uh, the, the the circle concept that you have uh, for the marketing can kind of help make sure that uh, if you have a good idea, that it doesn't fail. And if you don't have a good idea, that uh, maybe it helps you uh, pivot Find a good something idea. that that can't succeed. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Thank you. Uh, I just made it up. Um, give us, <laughs> we're, our marketing arm. There you go. What's we're running out of time. Can you give us just a couple more takeaways, some quick takeaways of what people can expect from this book? Again, fast track well, business. It, it will, as you know, one of my passions is measurement and metrics. And so the book does weave that in throughout and it ends on what kinds of metrics and measures you really need to be thinking about and uh, that are customer centric. And I think that's an important thing because we have a tendency to have a lot of measures and metrics all over the board for marketing and for businesses. And I think it's important to just get in on a few critical ones, like how sticky are, are your customers? Are they going to leave you? You know, are they, you know, what's your churn rate? Basic things that you're paying attention to. Um, what are, can you grow your share of wallet with a customer? Basic things that make you be more customer centric. And that's a key part of the book. And we weave in measures and metrics all along the way. I've got one last gotcha question for you. How many pages in the book? 
the book. Oh gosh. All right. So the book is <laughs> You've got it there on you, I can see. So <laughs> 190 pages. And after that is just, you know, things like uh bio and and uh acknowledgments and indexes and endnotes. So it's 190 pages. It's intended to be um a fairly quick read, but clearly if you're gonna use it as a working book, it's gonna take you some time to plow through. Yeah, it sounds that way. You might want to have a pen with you. You'll be taking some notes in the uh in the yeah, right in and we it, it's available both as a in, in as a, 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 a ebook like through Kindle or in some place like that as well as a hard copy, and we're working on figuring out how to get it into an Audible. We know people like to listen. Thank you for having a podcast where people can listen. Yep. Well, here's what we'll do. We'll just do a podcast a day where you read a chapter until it's over, and then we'll be done. <laughs> and uh -huh. how do we get that? Would be cool, but not my voice because I don't think anyone yeah. wants to listen to me. I, someone told me that this book will take five hours of listening time uh, to do, uh, and um, no one would want to listen to me for five hours. I really appreciate ah. the fact they're listening to me for 50 minutes. I turn my, I listen to so many audiobooks. I actually really like it when the author reads them because I'm getting their voice. It's always weird when I hear the voice and I'm picturing it, and then I find out that wasn't the author, and I'm kind of bummed, like, oh, I got, I got duped. That was an actor. Uh, but also, if people say it's going to take five hours, great. It'll take two and a half because you'll listen to it on double speed. And then you exactly. don't have to worry about your voice. It's not your voice. It's some chipmunk voice. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good to know. I think I sound like a chipmunk already. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then you can listen to it twice in the five hours. <laughs> you guys have been awesome. I, I so appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you for coming on, Laura. And get the book. How do we get the book? Uh, you can get it. You can go to our website and we'll take you to all the places. We can get it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, some uh, uh, local bookstores like uh, Book People and Powell's. Uh, you can come to a card copy, ebook. E you can find all the different ways on our website, visionedgemarketing.com. Of course, you can go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble and type in Fast Track Your Business, Laura Patterson, and we'll come right up to the top. Fantastic. So um, we'll put that in the show notes as well on ifymarket.com along with uh, more information on uh, how to reach out to, uh, to Laura Patterson, our guest today. And uh, please share us on social media. Tell, uh, tell some friends, give us a good review or two on iTunes. And on behalf of Marla Jo Helms and the If You Market team and Laura Patterson of Vision Edge Marketing, thank you for listening to the If You Market podcast, where we believe if you market the shit out of it, with uh, by fast tracking your business by fast tracking your business with laura patterson's book they will come yes <laughs> thank you all thank you so much